Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, my name is Robert Schumacher, and today I'm going to be talking about how you can write your libraries to be easily packaged into systems that you do not even know exist. So this is a spiritual successor to a talk that I gave last year at CppCon, which is available on YouTube. And I recommend that you go and watch that maybe on your own time after this. But again, this is about how can you avoid having to package yourself into all of these different ecosystems? Because there are a lot of different ecosystems out there. There are the things that you've heard of, apt. There's things that you will hear about, VC package, Conan, Hunter, et cetera. And then there are the systems that you will never hear about because they're private. They're private packaging systems implemented by large corporations for their own internal use. And by following these guidelines, your library will be easily packaged and easily used even in these systems that you haven't explicitly designed around. So I'm going to be talking from the point of view of a package maintainer. This is the person who will take what you've written and they will be adapting it into some sort of package ecosystem. Every point that I make here is, is from that perspective, which means that these are not laws. These are not things that you absolutely must do. But when you violate them, your project will be more difficult to package in one way or another. In this talk, I'm going to be including some examples from very real software out there, very real libraries. And sometimes they do things correctly, and sometimes they do things according to these rules incorrectly. This isn't to say that they're bad libraries. They're all wonderful libraries. You should use them. But we're, they're demonstrative of how this can go wrong in the real world or not happen the way that would be most convenient in the real world. So first, to go over the four quadrants of how package management works. You have the authors, which is presumably all of you out there, who write awesome libraries which want, you want to be reused in many different applications. There's the users, who are the people that you typically think about when you're writing your library. These are the people who are calling your APIs. These are the people who are going to ship your DLLs or your SOs, or they're going to static link you inside of their project. But there's two other aspects of the ecosystem that are often not thought about. One is there may be other libraries. There's the libraries underneath you. There's libraries that will be built on top of you. And then there's also the maintainers, those people whose job it is to take whatever it is that you've written and act as an intermediary between you and the users, to make it so that the users can use your code easily. These are often volunteers. They often are not contributors to your project. They may have never even called a single one of your APIs. And so what that means is that they don't necessarily know the domain knowledge of your particular project and your particular idiosyncrasies. So a lot of what goes into making your library packageable is following conventions and guidelines in the same way that other projects can also follow. So the first point that we'll talk about is not to make me build things that I don't need. Oftentimes people, they design their build systems for their particular library thinking about their software as kind of a distribution. They want to build every possible thing that anyone could ever possibly need all at the same time. This means they'll build samples, they'll build example code, they'll build documentation, they'll build multiple flavors of their library. They might build optional tools. I don't usually need all of that. In fact, oftentimes, I need just one thing. I just need your library. I just need your library and your headers. Um, so your .a or your .so, not both. I know which one of those that I want. And so give me an option in your build system to choose just that. This is most commonly subverted in the case of things like documentation. So I have, cannot count the number of times that I've seen a library try to find Doxygen on the system and use whether it found Doxygen to determine whether or not it wants to build documentation. Now, you may, if you've used Doxygen, you probably know it's not the fastest thing in the world. And so this comes up with, on some systems, the library builds in 30 seconds. On other systems, it builds in two minutes and 30 seconds because it found Doxygen. Even though I can't be depending on the documentation being there, because the job of a package manager is to produce the same thing on any different system, right? So my objective is to give the same results, whether you have Doxygen installed or whether you don't have Doxygen installed. 
And so that means that these auto this auto detection is really subverting what my purpose is, because my consumers will only ever depend on the library itself being there. Building all of these extra things optionally is not required and is actively harmful. Don't create spurious errors. Don't build with where by default. So your users, in, especially in an open source world, are not necessarily going to be using a compiler that you've tested. I, I applaud attempts to try to test as many compilers as possible, and that's a fantastic thing and you should do it. When you're doing your own development on the compilers that you're testing, you absolutely should build with wearer and wall. But when you're distributing your application, when you're distributing your library, I'm sorry, your consumers are going to be using maybe newer compilers than the ones that you were testing at the time you made your release. And if your use of wearer or WX results in your build failing, now your user has a serious problem. They have to go into your code, either figure out how to turn that off, which oftentimes some developers don't provide a way to turn it off, and so now I have to patch your build scripts in order to turn that off. Or I have to patch your code to try to fix whatever that warning is, you know, uninitialized variable here, or I can prove that this branch of the if statement is never taken, and so you shouldn't even have it, it's dead code. These are useful warnings to you as a developer, but these are not useful warnings to your consumer. And so you should definitely provide a way to, to not pass where on, and probably not do that by default. As an example, in the real world, Facebook Folly did this until rather recently. They used to have uh, slash w error unconditionally on Unix, and in April of this year, they removed it, and there's a nice long GitHub comment about exactly why they decided to remove this, and it really boils down to the number of compilers in the wild is far larger than you can ever imagine and want to test yourself. And having wearer unconditionally just results in more bug reports than it is useful for you to address. And the second part is don't be directly hostile to the compiler. There is generally no need to say if the compiler version is greater than the version that you've tested, hard error. You think that's crazy, but it happens. So PMDK 142 had exactly this check. It said if MSCVCVR is greater than 1911, which corresponded to some particular VS release, then hard error because they hadn't actually built that code on that compiler before. Be optimistic. Be optimistic about your users and let your users try to compile things in environments that you may not necessarily have tested because there's no way that you can actually test every single environment. Next, clarify your interface. And by interface here, I mean something much broader than you think of interface. When I think of interface, I think of namespaces. I think of files. What is public? What is private? You should think about what namespacing you're using and what public, what actually in your distribution is public and what is private. If a user needs to use it to consume your project, it is public. Header-only libraries, for example, are entirely public. Yes, you may have files that you consider to be implementation, but those are public files for the purposes of a package manager. And then once you've understood what is public, what's not, you should try to logically consider your build in terms of individual components. The idea is, is that every component will share the same properties. So this means it will all, they, all of the pieces within this component will have the same compiler flags. All of the pieces in this component will share the same target executables that they get built into. Every, shared, every piece of this component will all go into the same binary, et cetera. The reason for doing this is that, honestly, it will make your build simpler. Your build should be amenable to globs. Now, you may choose not to use these. There are reasons not to use them. There are reasons to use them. CMake, in specific, has been improving support for globs over time, so if you have previously heard the advice, don't use globs, I highly recommend you reconsider that with the new features that are available. But conceptually speaking, the number of components you have is far smaller than the number of TUs you have. And if you organize your system according to those components instead of according to individual files, the number of moving parts will be smaller, your build will be simpler. If you need to multi uh, maintain multiple build systems because you have, you know, maybe you have MS build files and CMake files, or you have MS build and AutoConf, or 
CMake and AutoCon, any combination. That will be easier because it will be obvious what, how those builds should be structured because build systems really are structured around these sorts of components. They really don't care about the individual object files. Furthermore, as I've said in the past, package management, honestly, is a problem not just in space but in time. This means that package management is about how do we deal with changes over time. And it is very common to want to add a new file to an existing component. And that's straightforward if those components are logically separated on the file system. It's easy to understand what was supposed to happen, and it's easy to detect mistakes while doing that. But if things are intermixed, then these updates over time become complicated because if a mistake happens, it's unclear what should have happened. Think of it as an error correcting code of sorts. Having the same information in two places helps. Or by using globs, having the information in only one place and in creating your build system such that it respects that final definition of truth. I have some examples on the left and the right of what makes good namespacing, what makes good file system hierarchy, but I think that that's pretty obvious. In the wild, I I'm going to point out Angle here. Angle is a huge project. It's a wrapper around, um, it's a wrapper around DirectX on Windows that provides an OpenGL-like interface, so you can use OpenGL calls, but then actually call DirectX under the hood. Um, it's, a, it's a great component. It's used by many, uh, many different complex systems in the real world, and they have a lot of different moving parts. They have a lot of different moving parts, but they have organized them very close to the exact guidelines that I'm giving here, that they are really organized around components. However, they stop a little bit short in terms of tests and in terms of platform-specific headers. So as I said, a component, all of the files are treated the same. And if, that, if the files that you choose to compile are different on different platforms, that makes those platform pieces a component because they work differently. You can think about this, and maybe this is a reason why you should consider putting an, a giant if def around your uh, entire implementation to disable sections on a particular platform. And what this enables you to do is it enables you to have fewer total components. Because yes, I get an empty object file, but from the build perspective, it's much simpler. I just compile all the CPP files, and in your code, you have decided what is relevant and what is not, instead of requiring that granularity to be expressed in the build system itself. Next on interface is licenses. So licenses are a critical component of your interface. People can only use you if they comply with your license. That's why you have a license. So don't just provide a link. Don't just, or don't embed this license file in, you know, thousands of times across your repository in all of the possible text files that you can find. Instead, provide a single file named license.txt that has the full text of your license and nothing else, and then use a system like SPDX. We always talk in the C++ community about how we want better tooling. Here is an opportunity for you to actually support better tooling. SPDX is a fantastic standard. I wholly recommend it. And we do too. Uh, the Microsoft STL repository, which was open sourced earlier this week, uses SPDX in all of its files. And this enables tooling to understand the licenses better. Another part of your interface is your support. What should users be using? What should they test bugs against? And how often should they be migrating forward? These are part of how you are used, which means they're part of your interface. In most cases, open source projects will want to, want to be one of either latest stable. You should always be testing your bugs against latest stable. You should be filing issues against latest stable. You should be building against latest stable. or Master is always the latest stable, and all of the above still apply. I think that this is good. I think that, that this is fine. There's nothing wrong with having that as your support guideline, really. Uh, Live it head is actually fine from a package manager perspective, because when I package it, I'm going to take a cut of whatever your master is at that time, and I'm going to make sure to test it, and I'm going to make sure that everything still works, and there's no problem with this. Shipping too often is never a complaint that I have had. Rarely. Uh, larger projects might want to provide LTS releases. Now, this can be incredibly expensive, so I strongly recommend you really think about this and whether or not it's right for your particular project. And finally, whatever support strategy that you do take, make sure that that is clear. I'll explicitly pull, point out OpenSSL in this case. 
uh, OpenSSL has a, a web page release strategy, which goes into excruciating detail about exactly what is supported, what is not supported, what they intend to do with their version strategy moving forward, and dates associated with all of the above. And it's fantastic. If you are interested in providing strong, mature support for your library over time, you should read this document and make sure you know why they've done what they've done. I'll also note just as a PSA, OpenSSL 1.0.2 is dropping out of security support at the end of this year. So if your systems are dependent upon OpenSSL, you should make sure that you're using 1.1 or that you are prepared to migrate to 1.1 very soon. So I said shipping often is never a complaint that I've ever had, and that's absolutely true. By shipping often, what this does is it minimizes the delta between what users have access to through package managers or through your official support strategy and bugs that you have fixed in master. The longer you wait to ship the fixes that you have added, the more likely it is that more users are going to stumble upon those fixes or stumble upon those bugs that you have already fixed, so they're going to create spurious bug reports. And it also means that users are in a tough spot because they need those fixes. They need those fixes, but you've told them to use the latest stable version, and so there's, there's an uncomfortable hypocrisy to that to a certain extent. As an example, AWS ships approximately every day. The AWS SDK for C++, it ships approximately every day. Uh, they, it's based on some internal strategy that they have. Boost ships three times a year. They also ship some betas, but they're three times a year, the stable versions. Those are in December, August, April. It's very reliable. And then Facebook Folly ships once every week, and they cut a tag on their latest master every week, and they just put the date in, and that's, that's that. All of these schemes are great. They are awesome. You should consider adopting any of these that works for you. Do not ship once a year or later. Do not ship once a year, <laughs> please. Uh, if you're in active development and you're actually committing code. So finally, all of these libraries are available in VC Package. Uh, we have 110, or, uh, 1,100 libraries now and counting, and you can go and try all of them. We deal with all of these problems that I've mentioned. We've dealt, we deal with all of these so that you don't have to, and uh, we'd love for you to be part of our community and send us some PRs. So, that is all for my talk, and I have 10 minutes for questions. Thank you very much. So I believe there should be a microphone in the middle of the room. If you'd like to ask a question, please line up. So just to clarify about blobbing, are you advocating the use of like file blobbing in CMake to list source files? Yes. Uh, so um, I have, in my development experience, I have found it to not be a problem. Uh, I've, not, I've not run into the issues that others have uh, stated. So yes, I do personally use globs, and I think that they work great. Specifically in the, uh, there is a, another case here though. So let me quickly go back to the, yes. So here I note that build replacement will be simpler. So unfortunately, it turns out that in practice, I very often need to replace the build system of the library. For one reason or another, maybe the, uh, the library makes some sort of deep assumption about the way the system works, and that is a false assumption, and the patch file to fix the library will be larger than the replacement itself. This happens surprisingly often. Uh, the case of Angle, for example, earlier that I mentioned, in Angle's case, we do provide a build system replacement, and this build system replacement is infinitely easier if I can simply say, this component lives in that directory, these are the flags to compile it. This component lives in that directory, these are the flags to compile it, and this binary is comprised of that, that, that component. Then I have three things to manage instead of 600 things to manage based on however many TUs you have. So that is why, um, that is why maybe in your own code, even if you choose not to use globs for your own build system, it is still worthwhile to follow these guidelines. Your build system will still be simpler, and if someone else needs to use globs or you decide to transition to globs in the future, especially with the improved support that CMake has added, that will be as easy and painless as possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, on that note though, could you expound on what added support you're talking about in CMake? Because in the latest CMake documentation, they explicitly discourage using file blobs or source files. Uh, 
yes, uh, I again, uh, there there have been many talks on this on this uh, point that people have experienced various bad things about the ways uh, that globs work, and so for some people, for some workflows, they will not work. However, in recent CMake versions, they've added some support to, for example, the Ninja generator, such that when files have changed, or when the, uh, I believe it's when the directory contents have changed, that they will automatically run a reconfigure. Uh, I forget exactly the, the specifics of how it works, but there has been explicit support to improve globs in CMake added. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, many of the successes of newer languages come from the fact that they have package management baked mm -hmm. in. Yes. There is a single solution uh, for it. Um, yep. Uh, do you think that the C++ standard committee should maybe address that and make that part of the, of the C++ specification somehow, or should there at least be a focus group uh, on that? And, um, um, I mean, there's a lot of options out there now, a common BC package. Um, it's just hard to navigate. Um, so what's your take on that? Yeah, so thank you for attending. Um, the, what I would say about whether we should put something into the standard. Um, in C++, we kind of have something somewhat unique amongst languages. We have an ISO specification. This is incredibly good in many ways. It means that there is actually a agree, like community agreed upon source of truth. However, it comes with some costs. And one of the big costs of that source, uh, that like rock solid source of truth is that we do not like to change it very much. We care very much about maintaining support for things over a long period of time. What that means is, is that if we don't know the full and complete answer to a problem, putting it in the standard can hinder us getting better and improving over time. So what I would say is that eventually, when we know the solution to package management, when we have a clear and obvious solution and um, winner, if you will, when we have a clear and obvious, this is clearly what you should use for C++, all of the rest of them have, are not as good or for whatever reason, at that point, absolutely we should consider it for standardization. Until then, though, I believe that the standardization process could hinder our ability to discover more in this space. Um, and I believe that this perspective also applies to build systems. We have had many build systems in the past, but there's new build systems coming around every day that do different things. Um, I, I think that what Basil is doing, what Buck is doing, um, are very interesting. What Mizon is doing, those are very interesting developments. They do things differently. And so I think that we are still exploring the space and we don't really know what the true answer is over time. And so I would hesitate to put things like that into the standard um, when it would hinder our further progress. Does that cover your question? Thanks. Thank you very much. Hey, Robert. Hey. Uh, one of the first problems you mentioned was the use of WX and new files if I recall correctly the site. Yes. This one. Uh, I'm of the opinion that it's the kind of thing that you never have in a new file, and you should actually have people who use build code files or tool chains. Yep. Files more and more. Totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, so for what uh, Mikhail is talking about is toolchain files for CMake. So CMake has a system of toolchain files where you can define build settings, compiler settings, linker settings. You can define all of these in a separate file called a toolchain file, and you can provide that to the build as part of configuring. This is actually a really elegant and really powerful system. It is available in other build systems as well. But what it lets you do is kind of have one, your cmakelist.txt files. Those are really just describing your project in an abstract sense. And then you have toolchain files, which are talking about all of the targets that you could target. And when you combine these together, you get the power of the sort of n squared thing here while only defining each of the axes. It's an incredibly powerful system, and I cannot encourage its use enough. So as Matthew pointed out, wair and uh, slash wx are exact examples of something that would make a great one of these toolchain files. It's kind of a target, a different target or a different compiler that you're targeting in a certain sense. Um, so I would highly recommend that. However, pragmatically today, user, uh, developer workflows are not toolchain-centric 
unfortunately. Developers want to just implement that in their build system, and all I am suggesting is if you insist on doing so, please put your developer build settings on, behind a flag, or even if it's on by default, please give me an option to turn that off. Think that covers it? Thank you. It's a great question. So uh, if there are no other, oh, yeah, if there are no other questions, um, then thank you again. Thank you all for attending. Uh, we have the Microsoft booth uh, across the hall, which I'll be at until, say, 5 o'clock today. And I'd be more than happy to chat with you about any of this or otherwise. So thank you again for attending.